Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to Consumer Politics in the American Revolution, an online professional development seminar sponsored by America in Class from the National Humanities Center. My name is Richard Schramm. I'm the Vice President for Education Programs here at the Center, and I'll be moderating this evening's session. Before we get underway, let me take a minute or two just to introduce you to the National Humanities Center. We are located in Research Triangle Park, North Carolina. We are the country's only independent institute for advanced study in all branches of the humanities. Let me see if I can explain what that means. First of all, we're independent. That means we're a private, nonprofit organization. We're an institute for advanced study, which means that we run a fellowship program here. That's our main program. And we bring <clears throat> scholars from this country and abroad to the center for an academic year to research and write on topics in subjects like history, literature and languages, philosophy, criticism of the arts, that sort of thing. We opened in 1978. We've had about 1,300 scholars work here since then, and they've produced about 1,300 books as a result of research done here at the center. The place may sound like an ivory tower, and from these pictures it looks like an ivory tower. We've got a spiral staircase running right through the middle of the building, and it's all white and glass, as you can see. But we're not an ivory tower. We're interested in connecting with a wide array of audiences, and we're particularly connected particularly interested, rather, in connecting with teachers. And we do that in a variety of ways. Now, I'm not going to go into all the details about how we do that this evening, but if you go to americainclass.org, that will land you on this page. And from this page, you can get access to all of the resources and programs we provide for American history and literature teachers. Now, after the seminar ends tonight, you can go to the, Amer to the Consumer Politics in the American Revolution webpage, and there you will find a recording of the seminar along with the PowerPoint. Please feel free to use the PowerPoint in your classes. It's there for you to plunder. You will also find an evaluation form. We ask you please to fill that out and submit it to us. You can do it online. It's very important to us. We pay attention to what you tell us, and we try to make the seminars uh, better on, on the basis of your feedback. Once we receive your evaluation, we'll send you a letter that will document your participation in the seminar, and you can present that letter to your local certifying authority to get whatever recertification credit the seminar warrants. Now, I want to talk about our goals this evening. I'll get to our intellectual goal, but before I get to that, I'd like to emphasize that we are trying to align our seminars with the new Common Core state standards. Now, some of you may not be in states that have adopted the Common Core, but probably most of you are. And you know that in the English and language arts and literacy and history um, standards, the Common Core seeks to help ensure that all students are college and career ready in literacy. And they seek to do that by promoting close, attentive reading and fostering a deep and thoughtful engagement with high quality literary and informational texts. And those are the goals of our seminars. We hope to engage you tonight in close, attentive reading of some uh, high quality information informational text, and we hope to show you uh, a better way or, or suggest some interesting ways that you can do the same thing with your students as you work to meet the goals of the Common Core. Now, let me explain how our seminar will work tonight. Uh, Professor Green will lecture. He will provide a lecture that will be keyed to a presentation of slides with excerpts that illustrate important points. The seminar will not be entirely lecture. We're going to stop. Uh, in some cases, we'll, we'll look at uh, documents and we will simply excerpt, uh, we will simply highlight important takeaway points in excerpts. But in other excerpts, we'll stop and analyze them closely to uh, model that kind of close reading that the Common Core calls for. And we want you to participate in the seminar through the chat. Our seminars are much more interesting and much more insightful when we have a lot of chat from the participants. And you can do that by putting your cursor down in the green box that you see I have bracketed at the bottom of the screen. Uh, type your message, hit the send button to the right, and your message will appear in the larger box above the uh, chat box. I will be watching the chat very closely and bringing it into the conversation at appropriate times. Now, I said we had an intellectual goal for the seminar, and this is it. We hope that you will be able to communicate to your students that during the year before national independence, colonial Americans invented a new form of political resistance, transforming an exciting consumer marketplace into an effective weapon against perceived imperial oppression. By refusing to buy imported goods, a decision that required genuine sacrifice, they at once influenced imperial policy and developed a power way, powerful way rather, 
to identify ideological friends and enemies. Now we had a pretty good discussion of the topic on the forum. We had a number of questions. What role did women play in establishing and maintaining the non-importation strategy? Was alcohol among the consumer goods the Patriots boycotted? Was the boycott a new political strategy at the time? What hardships did not importation impose on the colonies? How effective was the boycott? And finally, were there regional differences in adherence to the boycott? To help us thread our way through those questions this evening, we're very pleased to have with us Tim Breen, uh, who is the uh, professor, uh, professor of American History at Northwestern University and the director of the Cabraja Center for Historical Studies at Northwestern. Tim has written widely on uh, colonial America and the American Revolution. He was a fellow here at the National Humanities Center, and I'm very pleased right now to turn the program over to Tim. Tim, it is all yours, so tell us about consumer politics in the American Revolution. Okay, uh, Richard, you can hear me okay? I can. We can hear you loud and clear. Good. Well, look, uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's a great pleasure for me to be with you um, uh, this evening or this afternoon. I'm talking to you from Pasadena, California. Uh, I would say that this program, sponsored by the National Humanities Center and particularly this outreach uh, program uh, for a new standards has been one of the most exciting uh, challenges I've had as a teacher. And I welcome your questions. I'm going to try as best I can uh, to answer them. Uh, the ones that I've received are, are all good ones. None of them are frivolous or uh, ill-informed. Um, let me just say quickly that this presentation is part of my general scholarly goal uh, as a historian of the American Revolution to reinsert ordinary men and women. Uh, they used to be called common people, but ordinary farm families into the story that we tell ourselves about the American Revolution. You might say, well, that makes sense. What's the problem? But as you know from your textbooks, most of the narratives of, uh, uh, for teachers uh, are designed around a small group of founding fathers, the Washingtons, the Adamses, the Jeffersons, and so on. These were great men. They deserve to be part of the story, and I have no attempt, I have no desire uh, to erase them. Nevertheless, they had to interact with the people. Without the people, without the sacrifice, without their organization, uh, there would have been no independence. There would be no United States of America. And sometimes that key and obvious point uh, is forgotten. And so this brings uh, me to the assemblage of what I think are some wonderfully exciting documents for teaching uh, and for understanding the revolution tonight about um, the consumer boycotts, the development of consumer uh, boycotts. And I'd like to stress uh, three themes, which uh, you can send in questions as we talk or after the uh, session. But let me just um, stress that the first one is that the boycott, and by that I mean the interruption of a consumer marketplace for political purposes, was a total innovation, a brand new political weapon invented and supported and developed by the ordinary American people. Let me, let me say that again, because I think sometimes we, we seize upon something like the, um, the Tea Party uh, and, 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 and assume that that was it. But in fact, as you know from the documents today, the boycott as a political possibility developed slowly but massively throughout the colonies. And it was without precedent. No other country, no other society had used the consumer marketplace before to achieve goals, in this case, to achieve goals of sacrificing for what we call national independence. It's very important because we tend to stress things like uh, the balanced constitution uh, as the innovative elements of the American Revolution. But the people were busy making their own contribution, and we must not shortchange them. The second uh, theme tonight is to trace the development of this uh, marvelous new political weapon from a world of pleasure 
at mid-century when men and women were buying new stuff, all kinds of little things that brought them pleasure, made them feel warmer, happier, prettier, sexier, uh, and they went to the marketplace uh, to uh, buy these things. But slowly, and this is the process we want to follow as much as we can tonight, slowly, the personal became the political. Personal pleasures were redefined as political signs of ideology. You looked the part of the patriot. You sacrificed your pleasures in the marketplace for an imagined common good or national destiny. The process then is clear. By making little sacrifices in your family, you were able to achieve a greater political and common good. And I'm sure some of your students who probably have more electronic gizmos on their person every day that I know how to use might be challenged about the nature of sacrifice in order to achieve political ends, about sneakers, about iPads, about iPhones. I wouldn't push it too much, but the nature of sacrifice for a larger political destiny is a key story in our own uh, revolution. And the final point, and I, Richard is right, I don't want to make a lecture, but it's important to bring out the uh, e extraordinary teaching possibilities here. And one of them, uh, by the way, is to ask your students to look at colonial newspapers, which are easily accessible online, and ask them to interpret advertisements, ask them to interpret store goods, inventories, and ask them about political possibilities. But the third element I want to stress is that we are asked rightly uh, to develop inclusive narratives of the past. And that means, among other things, bring women into the stories in a way that's not patronizing or that we don't have symbolic women. I can't tell you how many history is the American Revolution I have, where it seems that the only woman that possibly lived was Abigail Adams, and she's cited over and over. But let me tell you, the boycott movement was a mass movement of middle and ordinary people. And without women, without women in the marketplace making sacrifices in their families, it is hard for me to imagine that this particular vehicle of protest could possibly have succeeded. In other words, we don't have to have a condescending view of women in politics. They are there. They really mattered. And it's very important because sometimes students, especially women students in my classes, tune out because they think they're going to get one more history of founding fathers and military actions and ho-hum, where are the women? Well, I'm telling you, if you follow these documents, the women are centrally located in the great political narrative of independence in our country. So those are three, three themes, the innovative nature of the boycott, its development from pleasure to politics, and the inclusiveness of the story that uh, brings in um, women. Okay, Richard, is there, is that? Um, uh, that sounds like a good introduction to me, Tim. Why don't we move on into the documents? Okay. Well, we have um, these uh, introductory uh, elements, which I, 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 um, I, I touched on. I suppose the fourth that we should just, it, it's so hard for students and people alive today to get over the, uh, the fourth one on your introductory um, uh, slide here. Uh, people seem to believe that in a world before Walmarts and Costco, we all uh, went hunting with our bare hands and ate raw woodchuck in some, or we, we made candles or we wove everything we wore. It was a primitive economy. One of the elements that you will learn tonight is that the American economy, the colonial economy, was not self-sufficient. It was sophisticated, vital. The choice of goods that men and women could buy rivaled what any of us today could. And women went to the store, men went to the store, they bought uh, most of the cloth 
overwhelmingly the cloth that they made into garments was store bought. I often tell my students that one of the great lies of museums today is the spinning wheel by the fireplace. You've seen it, it's the, the little woman spinning away at night while her husband reads um, Cato or the Bible. But that just wasn't true. Most women bought store-bought goods because they knew that if they made cloth themselves, their children would starve. There just simply wasn't enough time. So that's, that is an element uh, that we should, it's not self-sufficient. Tim, before we go on, maybe this would be a good opportunity to address one of the questions from the forum. Was okay. alcohol among the goods boycotted? Alcohol? No, it wasn't. And uh, there's a very good uh, reason for that, uh, other than the sheer pleasure of a, of a drink. Um, it wasn't imported from Britain. In other words, the boycott turned, or the market protest turned, upon that range of goods that was brought from Great Britain to America. And the colonists pretty, were pretty good at making uh, whiskey and rum and beer on their own, Richard. So we had all that corn and rye. We had to do something with it, right? Absolutely. In fact, one of the first uh, rebellions of the 1790s was the so-called Whiskey Rebellion, when the federal government tried to tax some of the guys that were making um, uh, moonshine on the frontier of Pennsylvania and Virginia. No, they knew how to make it. The, okay. big, the big elements are the ones that we see in this wonderful quotation from the autobiography of Benjamin Franklin. Now, here we are. He's writing this later in the 17. 70s, but he's looking back at a time when he and his wife were living in Philadelphia, and he was doing pretty well. And they begin to acquire these wonderful consumer items. And so I might ask you, in your thinking about this or using your class, was Franklin really embarrassed about the arrival of the uh, pewter spoon and the uh, other items? Who did he blame for going out and getting them and bringing in these expensive china bowls and spoon of silver? And since we know it was his wife he blamed, what was her rationale for buying it? We begin to see, in other words, the workings of this wonderfully rich, vibrant consumer marketplace in the mid middle of the century. Of course, Franklin thinks it's great. I mean, I found, I found his breakfast, I found it in a china bowl with a spoon of silver. They had been bought for me without my knowledge by my wife. And it cost her an enormous sum of three and 20 shillings, for which she had no other excuse or apology to make but she thought her husband deserved a silver spoon and china bowl as well as any of his neighbors. Wow, she's a smart lady. She knew how to play on his vanity, which wasn't a hard challenge. So we have a woman in the marketplace determining the expenditures of the household and a husband and wife desiring to look pretty good, pretty successful in the eyes of their neighbors. Tim, we have some we have some comments here in the in the chat. Uh, one um, person writes, "Is blame the right word? Was Franklin upset with his wife or grateful to her?" Let's hear some comments about that. That was, that would be a good discussion question. And here another person writes, "Franklin's frugality was in conflict with his wife's spending. Franklin probably didn't like the influx of foreign goods either." Did he like the influx of foreign goods uh, or, or not, uh, Tim? Well, um, uh, with somewhat of a tongue-in-cheek, uh, I, 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 I've described Benjamin Franklin as the greatest yuppie of the 18th century. He loved good stuff. And when he went to England uh, for the first time, I have letters I've used in one of my books called Marketplace of Revolution, where he sends his poor wife 
gizmos he finds in England. And in one letter, he says, I'm not sure what this is for, but everyone in England has one. And it turned out to be a one of those apple slicers that you crunch down an apple and makes it into six nice, neat slices at once. No, he loved this stuff. And perhaps it is too strong to uh, blame his, uh, his wife. She, she was a, an eager accomplice. What, what, what we're getting here is two people are celebrating these goods and making status claims, maybe that's the way to say, by their visible consumption. It, it, it's, it's a visible activity in front of neighbors. I noticed that he says here we had a, a breakfast of uh, bread and milk, no tea. Right. What's the significance of that? Well, that's interesting. I'd be uh, uh, this this would be like a, a wonderful little uh, puzzle for uh, the participants tonight. Let me give you a hint. It seems that the word no tea was inserted as an afterthought in the 1770s when he was writing his autobiography. And the guess is he he was trying to make himself look politically acceptable after the tea party. So breakfast is a long time, bread and milk. Oh, by the way, no tea. I didn't have tea, which of course couldn't have been true. Tea was the most popular uh, common drink up until the tea party. Uh, and uh, no one, hardly anybody drank coffee. Uh, tea was uh, the major item. So I think he's he's engaging Richard in a little bit of retrospective political purity here. Uh, rewriting the past, huh? We have, a bit. we have a really good question here. Did colonists make sacrifices across the board, or did they supplement some of their goods from other countries like France? Well, they might have wanted uh, to supplement uh, the goods from France, but uh, under the uh, mm, colonial rule, uh, Parliament had a series of acts, which are called collectively the Navigation Acts, which meant that only British or British American ships could carry trade into American ports um, because of a, of a philosophy, economic philosophy known as mercantilism. It was thought that if French traders or Dutch traders were openly allowed to trade in America, that would somehow compromise the British economy. So um, they had a very, very rich trade, but the goods were made in England uh, or Scotland, Richard. They didn't have these French goods at stake yet. What about smuggling from, say, other countries and from Britain itself? There have been a number of really good studies of smuggling, especially uh, for Dutch tea, which is called bohia tea, uh, and no doubt it was um, uh, a, a, a good marginal trade. But in point of fact, uh, economists, economic historians, and there's some terrific ones who have studied this material, uh, the Americans in were uh, pretty satisfied with the price and the quality and the quantity and the range of goods that the mother country supplied. In other words, at the time that Franklin is writing, the Americans, they, they feel like they have a pretty good deal. Being a member of the British Empire in 1770 is um, a source of pride, not, not a burden. And I have never read a, a letter in which someone said, wow, boy, if we could only have a local store that uh, featured French and Dutch goods, we'd be even happier. Uh, in fact, no one said that. I, I, again, I'll even go one uh, point further, Richard. There are some studies of Native Americans, especially in the Southeast, where the Native Americans uh, have a choice between Spanish or English goods. Uh, and uh, they became pretty wise consumers and realized very early that English materials were made better, lasted longer, and uh, were cheaper. Okay. Well, Tim, we've got about a little over an hour to go. Why don't we move ahead then?
Okay, but I might say that in general, uh, the the uh, for teaching purposes, the autobiography of Benjamin Franklin is um, a wonderful uh, introduction to some of these uh, issues. But an even better one, and I urge you to think about it in your classrooms because it, it is an accessible uh, text. It's Hamilton's itinerarium. It's a mouthful. And his name was Alexander Hamilton. And no, he was not the Secretary of the Treasury. He wasn't even related to him. Alexander Hamilton lived in Maryland in the 1740s and 50s. He was a Scottish physician. He was a busybody. And in order to uh, improve his health, he decided to take a trip from Annapolis up to Boston and back uh, with his servant. And along the way, he kept this, this diary, which he called an itinerarium. And it is a hoot. There are, there are extraordinary funny lines. But this particular incident uh, with a man named Morrison uh, captures, as does Franklin's uh, autobiography, the possibilities of self-fashioning, of, uh, of, of claiming status through good. So here's this man, Morrison Richard. He's obviously uh, uh, not a, a very uh, good looking fellow. And his landlady um, uh, gives him a, a bad breakfast. Uh, who I suppose it took him for some plowman or, or carman and so presented him with some scraps of cold veal for breakfast and having declared that he could not drink your damn washy tea. As soon as he saw the mess, he swore, damn it, it wasn't out of respect of the gentleman in the company, in other words, Hamilton's watching. He would throw her cold scraps out the window and break her table to pieces, though it cost 100 pounds in damages. So here's this this guy that looks like um, kind of a, a mess, and he's treated like that by uh, Mrs. Curtis, presumably. But he's always, he's, he's eyeing Hamilton. And then when we go to the next slide, we see how he gets out of the situation. Then taking off his nightcap, he pulled a linen one. Wow, it's not wool, it's linen. Out of his pocket, clapped on his head. He says, now, I'm on the borders of Pennsylvania, must look like a gentleman. Now, nobody's going to take him to be a gentleman, but he, what he's doing is dressing to a different status. And then down in the highlighted text here, it's really a remark. He told us that though he seemed to be a plain, homely fellow, yeah, yet he'd have us know that he was able to afford better than many that went finer. In other words, he had a little money, and that's about status. He had good linen in his bags, a pair of silver bottles, silver clasps, gold sleeve buttons, two Holland shirts, and some neat nightcaps, and that his little woman at home drank tea twice a day. And he himself lived very well and expected to live better as soon as that damn old rogue blank died and secured him a title to his land. So he's telling this Scottish physician who is watching this scene, look, Buster, I just was going informally, but don't take it. That's not the real me. The real me is all these fine things that I have in my bags. I can put, I can put them, I can put on gold sleeve buttons and two Holland shirts right away and be a new man. So we see like Franklin that, that Morrison is negotiating status through this vibrant consumer marketplace that is open to fairly ordinary people. Are the things he mentions there, um, are they, how expensive were they? Well, they varied, but this is a, this is a good point, Richard, and one that I'd like the participants tonight to, to really know and maybe even take on faith. Uh, the economy of mid-century and pre-revolutionary America was pretty good, and we find that most people were able to participate in this marketplace. 
to be sure, rich people then as now bought better stuff. But the stores uh, were able and did sell lots of stuff to people like Morrison. It was a broad market. It was also a geographically dispersed market. And so we find that what stores sold in Charleston, South Carolina, was pretty much the same stuff that you bought in Boston. There's a, it's a broad colonial market uh, for these uh, wonderful goods. And I might add, although it's an aside, I wish I could have presented some documents tonight, but there's limits. Uh, this is the first time that uh, stores are offering long-term credit, like credit cards, low interest rates, incentives. I found one store in Philadelphia, Richard, that can you believe this? Uh, not only had bowed windows to display their goods so people walking the streets could look in and see what was for sale, but if you came in and bought something, you got a free cup of coffee, uh, i.e. Starbucks circa 1760. Anyways, these, this is, a, again, a really sophisticated marketplace that is closer to our experience today than um, the early, earlier, the 16, 1500s. Uh, capitalism, consumer capitalism, is really taken root within this empire. Okay, well, shall we move on, Tim? Yeah, but I, again, uh, I, um, I, I stress that this uh, Hamilton's itinerarium is full of little stories like this. And I would say as a teacher, I have found um, this one of my most, most successful assignments um, for what it's worth. Then we have, uh, we're moving, and we see the date, the Connecticut Journal. This is a world of newspapers. Newspapers um, um, survive in this period largely through advertising. Uh, as I, I said, you can have any of your students go to these colonial newspapers and uh, they'll be amazed at the selection. But gradually, very almost glacially, some people began to think, well, you know, this consumer marketplace is fine, but it comes with maybe a political price. Uh, it's the same, the same sense that maybe we felt in our own economy when the visa bill comes due. Boy, it was really great to get that new TV set, but wow, look at the interest building. Look at, we're a little bit in debt. And so people began in the 1760s to think, well, maybe the empire uh, might cost a little bit more than we're willing to pay. And they turn to thinking about manufacturing some of these goods at home. That was uh, one theme that began to develop on the ease. Could, could, could we be a little more fine, uh, um, independent in terms of making these goods? Now, no, they're not saying do without. They're saying, we'll make our own. And so here's this Connecticut Journal. When I consider the country we live in, and how it might abound in flax and wool to cover our nakedness and silk sufficient for ornament. And I might say the chances of making enough wool in the colonies was close to zero. And making silk was insane. It just couldn't be done. But nevertheless, this guy is saying, Let's be a little bit more self-sufficient. I've been obliged to look upon the importation of clothing from Europe and Asia as big a blunder in politics as if men should drink in a notion that the women were defective in their natural genius, that they are incapable of working up the produce of the country that bred them. Now here, I mean, this is a very interesting text. He's saying, maybe we should start making it ourselves, but not me, it should be the women well, you know, hey, women, you, you start making all these clothes. Uh, I'm not sure the women would have thought that was such a great idea since it's very, very hard to clothe a family. Uh, what we're seeing here is that because women were such an important part of this new consumer world that we've been looking at, and it came up both with ha uh, Hamilton 
and then again with Franklin. Women um, had to be involved. And so here a man is making a claim, honey, you do it, and maybe we'll be a little bit more independent. Tim, we have so, a question. <clears throat> oh, yeah. excuse me, we have a question. Is the author of this text, the Connecticut Journal, known? Do we know who it is? No. No, these, it's very frustrating, and that's a, it's a really good question. It's driven me to distraction. Uh, sometimes men take women's name in order to make a political point. Sometimes women write, and they really are women, but they all take um, – uh, pen names, Richard, and so you don't know. I mean, they, this guy here in Connecticut Journal, I'd, it might have been Publicus or Cato or Seneca or whatever. But you see that um, what we're, 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 what, what happens as goods become, begin to become politicized. And remember, we're not talking about getting back at Britain here. We're just talking about being um, maybe balancing the budgets a little bit. And so it becomes a battle of the sexes because women have to be involved. So this guy is saying, uh, well, look, um, uh, I offer both sexes. For, can we have a liberty of offering our thoughts in public and let the men resolve that the first of all, I will not from the first day make suit to any women, woman, whatsoever to be our wife, but what is dressed in homespun clothes. All right, so again, it's, it falls to the women to make homespun clothes. It probably wasn't true. I think the guys probably liked the woman that was with the latest fashion. But the point is that gender politics, even in the papers, is being debated around consumer goods. So, and then we go to the woman's side and let the women resolve. We will not from the date above entertain any man in our company that is so proud and foppish that he scorns to wear clothes brought by the women in this country. We will not accompany with any man who haunts the tavern and grogs at the expense of his senses. Now, someone asked earlier, were, was liquor a part of the boycott? The answer is no. But the women here in 1768 are saying, look, you want us to make homespun? Okay, but maybe you ought to stop spending all your time in the tavern, you know, drinking away our money and get with this new plan to be a little economically responsible. So they're calling their husbands home and their husbands are calling the women to make the stuff. And I'm not going to be flirted by any man that is has had more of a gill of rum that's like a you know big glass or half pint of wine in or receive compliments from a man that staggers. So guys, you better sober up for patriotism if you want to get that woman you've been flirting with. Yeah, we have a, a good question here. Wouldn't making their own clothing in the colonies make them, the, the colonists, seem less British since the colonists strove to be as British as they could be? So um, just how British were they at this point? And um, if they – we see the beginnings here of a desire to pull away from Britain. But the, that raises the interesting question. Just at, in, by 1768, how British were the American colonies, or they, had they really begun to find an identity of their own as Americans? Well, it's a, that's a, as you said, that's really a, a terrific uh, question uh, driven by insights. It's a little hard to measure identities, political identities, but most historians feel that the Americans were very happy and content with being part of the British Empire until the early 1770s. Um, and uh, so these goods and whatnot, they celebrated. And, and, and as one person said, uh, one historian, if you looked at men and women in the middle 1760s, they, they were emblematic of the empire, Richard. They looked, they wore, they ornamented their bodies with goods that were manufactured in England, 
And so to a sense, in a sense, pulling back and talking about making your own um, has a seed of rebellion in it. But the first impulse was to be economically more sensible, not run up your big Visa card debts, if I may use a modern uh, element. We have a response here from someone who is addressing one of the uh, two discussion questions there, to what extent did the boycott empower women? It's a very insightful response. The women were required, expected to provide the goods that were boycotted. It was now to the advantage of the women to use their needed labor to make changes that they desired. So here we see, as you said earlier, women being moved into the center of the political arena. Is that fair to say? That's absolutely, that's exactly one of the points I wanted to, to make tonight. We don't have a group of women who are, again, in modern terms, are, are for women's rights. They're not organizing for feminists. But the marketplace, as it becomes a political issue, inevitably brings women into the center of the debate. Because if women aren't on board, you know, these guys that are in the tavern our night, they're not going to be making the cloth. You know, without women, it isn't going to work. No one planned it that way, but very quickly women realized that they had negotiating power. Uh, and this is, a, this is a tremendous story. I might say, Richard, that um, there were some efforts of women to make cloth, and there were spinning contests, spinning wheels became, uh, like Gandhi in India, signs of you know, w uh, uh, patriotism. Women would try to make yarn. But it was pathetic because Americans had already become dependent on store-bought goods. It, was, it would be as, as if any of the participants tonight said, well, we're going, to, um, uh, we're going to put down our cell phones and our computers in protest against uh, uh, imports, and we're going to go back to writing letters uh, to our bank and to each other. Well, you know, it's bloody unlikely to happen. Uh, people become dependent or think they become dependent on these goods that make daily life more convenient, more desirable. So there's this debate going on about you know changing our ways, but it was really hard. We have an interesting comment here about the marketplace. The flourishing marketplace, with its increasingly uniform taste in consumer goods, becomes one of the sites where an American identity, that very marketplace, distinct from the British identity, is negotiated. So is, is the, the very fact that we have this marketplace and we're becoming dependent on these goods and we have this, this rise in status expressed in particularly American terms, does that work toward establishing an American identity? Um, I, yes, slowly. What, what, what's happened, as I said, is, is glacially people are reconsidering the place of goods in the home economy. And that sparks a debate about gender, sex relations, and, and, and so on. What we're doing is seeing the conditions in which these goods will become highly and aggressively political. But not to get ahead of our story, Richard, um, Americans were unable to be economically independent until the 1820s or 30s. Uh, many historians say that England was, in a sense, silly to deny Americans their independence because they had the American economy after the revolution. Americans went back and started buying these goods again after independence, but Britain didn't have to pay for the colonial establishment. So um, to see goods as, um, what would you say, uh, emblems of a new American identity, it probably happened, but not for a very long time. Yeah, we've been talking a great deal about women, and we have a really good question here about women and class. Should we assume mm -hmm. that we are talking about women in the lower or working classes of society rather than the upper classes? So how, wide, how widespread among uh, classes was uh, the uh, uh, women's participation in the boycott? 
I'd say these are. I'm glad you're. You know, I congratulate you to get my points. Maybe I'm being clear tonight for a change. Um, the market was very widespread in terms both of geography, all of America, and class. And we know, for instance, that um, women of uh, it's hard to say, you know, not poor, but they were drinking tea and they were wearing clothes that was made of imported um, cloth. And I might say, uh, as, as some of you know, maybe from your grandmothers, you, one seldom just serves tea. You have to have a tea set. And that, remember, it means a, a bowl for the hot water and the tea and maybe cream and, and sugar and whatnot. And we find in very, very modest homes, very modest homes, um, the appearance of these uh, metal tea sets uh, in order to support uh, this new consumer world. And I, again, getting back to Hamilton's itinerarium, he has some examples uh, for the person who asked this question uh, of very, very poor families who are buying stuff and he goes in there and he tut tuts because he's a an officious twit and he says oh whoa they have a mirror oh my god what a mirror why can't they just have a bowl of water and look at their reflections you know well these poor people they want a mirror because they want to see themselves as they ornament their bodies make themselves bodies cleaner and prettier and happier you know, they're not going to look in a bowl of water. And so, uh, yes, women of very, very modest means were able to participate in this extraordinary market. I might say, Richard, anybody that wants to follow this, one of the great historians of this new marketplace is an economic historian who teaches at uh, Berkeley. And he has a Dutch name, Jan de Vries, D E. V R I E S, and he has written a, a powerful book I recommend to everyone called The Industrious Revolution. And he argues that poor families uh, started working harder in this period so that they could buy some of these exciting goods. It was an incentive for work. And we need to move on. We've got about 45 minutes, but we have one, um, a very good question here about loyalists. Were there okay. loyalists who did not boycott? If so, were they victimized or discriminated against by other colonists? Yes, we'll get into the enforcement a little bit as we move along, uh, Richard. But um, once goods became identified with a revolutionary or patriotic cause, those people that continue to use imported goods, such as tea, were uh, identified and then at risk of being ostracized and then eventually physically punished for their unwillingness to join this uh, market boycott. Uh, I mean, one of the things about uh, organizing um, protest and resistance around goods is that you can tell who's for you and who's against you by looking at them, by what they wear. And uh, the loyalists um, had problems. There's a wonderful book by a loyalist by the name of Andrew Oliver, and he was a loyalist. And he talks about how he hates these consumer protests that um, um, and demand a level of sacrifice he doesn't think normal people should be asked to uh, do. So uh, the loyalists did suffer from this uh, political initiative. We have a question. Someone's raised a question that was raised earlier in the forum, so why don't we get to it right now? Okay. What regional differences were there in demand for products and in participation in the boycott? Question of regional differences. Right. Well, I would say in the in in the mid 1760s and say in 1770, uh, the boycotts were most most powerful in New England, 
But by 1773, 4, and 5, the boycotts, for reasons we'll explore in a few minutes, uh, were effective and enforced throughout America with equal rigor so that the importation of British-made goods because of politics um, was cut off in Charleston and Williamsburg and Philadelphia, New York, as well as New England. It became the rationale for a great, probably the first great political mobilization in what became our country's history. Okay, we've got about 40 minutes. Shall we move ahead then? Sure. And I, I love these questions. Uh, they're they're uh, re really, really good ones. Um, so we're, we're, we're still in the 1760s, but this piece from the New York Gazette, and again, I stress for the third time, the newspapers are terrific teaching vehicles. But he's, he's raising the writer, I assume it's a he here, uh, raises the problem or the proposition that these goods and the denial of these goods can become a political weapon. In other words, he's moving to the next step. It's, it's not just simply, it's going to cost you too much money and maybe you shouldn't overspend at the stores and maybe you're, the little woman should be more prudent with her expenditures. He's taking it to the next step. And I read, um, Richard, about six lines from the bottom. We are not indifferent whether our native country sinks, and sinks or swims. We don't set our trinkets and baubles. Now notice these wonderful goods that Franklin and Hamilton regarded as just great in their house, they're now being described as trinkets and baubles because the very, the very description of these goods is now becoming negative. They're burdened, they're part of our political oppression. So we don't set our trinkets about in competition with the prosperity of North America, but off with our gay feathers in a moment, if the public interest so requireth. Away with every article, costly finery, whatever that general parent great issues for injunctions. So, yeah, we don't really wish ill of England, but if England gets too pushy or continues these policies, we can do away with these goods. But the goods aren't just feathers, as we've seen. They're clothes, they're decorations on the body, they're guns, they're glassware, they're knives, they're mirrors. So what he's flirting with under all of these words, trinkets, baubles, gay feathers, is the potential of a huge sacrifice that Americans may be asked to make for independence. So he's escalating the talk now into politics. Uh, Tim, you said this was a male writer, but um, the voice seems to be female. I mean, what should think you to induce gentlemen? And then she goes on, or the writer goes on to talk about, and capable of feeling for our country, for our husband. So is this a yeah, yeah. You know, well, okay, yeah, woman, sure. or is it a guy writing under the guise of a woman? Well, <laughs> I'll, I'll accept it's a woman, and I made uh, a mistake. Um, as I as I say, um, there were plenty of male writers who advised women off with your gay uh, feathers. Um, it was amazing how much, uh, uh, for the women tonight, it's amazing how much the guys at the time were eager to advise women to make a sacrifice. There wasn't a lot of talk about guys making sacrifice for a while, but that's part of this gender competition. Uh, we have a very sharp reader here who has pointed out that a general parent versus mother nation, we're getting, is this an indication of a, you know, a movement away from England? Or, or what yeah. what yeah, was I the currency of that term, general parent, as opposed to, say, mother country? Um, I think this is part of uh, a general colonial um, lexicon. Um, but there's no question that um, this market protest or 
seeing some of the tensions in the marketplace is opening up fissures. Um, I, I think that that's a legitimate reading of general parent. Okay. We have another good question here. Was it common for a woman to be so well written, opinionated, and published at the time? I have to believe this is quite rare. Is it rare? No. That's another. I mean, there, there it's a lot of I I think a misunderstanding about women and women in in society and their achievements. There's no question. We have a fine study of literacy that was conducted by a. Um, uh, wonderful historian Kenneth Lockridge about literacy rates and let me just give you the general trends. Literacy among all people was greater in the north and decreases as you go south. So in New England at the eve of the revolution it's estimated that over 90 percent of the males were literate. By the time you get down to South Carolina, the number may be for males in the 80s, low 80s. But what's interesting is that women weren't that much farther behind. In other words, the idea that women are illiterate or unlettered or incapable of expressing their opinion um, just doesn't match the figures and the newspapers that I've read and frankly I've read every single one of these papers for the two decades before independence um, have a lot of women's writings poetry protests uh, protests about men getting drunk too often uh, they're out there uh, as maybe we should remember sometimes the past is uh, in plain sight we just have to Look for it. Okay. So well, we need we need to move on, but let me um, just pose this question to you. Got two that have come in here. Let's take the first one. Did the merchants in Britain who exported their wares to the colonies send grievances to the government in response to colonial boycotts? The merchants that imported these goods tended to be um, Americans who were in commerce. And um, they were caught in a tough vice between their British suppliers, who they owed money to, and their American consumers, who are putting pressure on them. And the, one of the first moves in the 1770s is that the Americans uh, began to say, well, look, merchants should stop buying this stuff. To which the merchants replied, well, look, I mean, we'll go out of business. You're just hurting a few people in society. And besides, if the merchants in Boston and Philadelphia go along with this, but the New Yorkers don't, then we're really going to be hurt by cheating. So there were these problems. As we see, or as we will see in a few minutes, by 1775, Americans have moved away from the position of pressuring merchants. And they're putting the responsibility of being patriotic consumers squarely on the shoulders of real people. In other words, in your own life, if you're not willing to support the boycott, then you're a loyalist, you're a Tory, you're no, you're no good for us. But part of what I talk about is the progression of this whole movement, and it's complicated, I realize, is that at first merchants were blamed and then by the mid 1770s, the people were responsible for their own political destiny. So we have the New London Gazette, uh, and we see in the highlighted bit down here, the truth is we have no occasion for British manufacturers. Uh, I'm sorry, yes we do, we're buying about 50% of all exports from Britain are coming to the colonies, but he's he's making this case, and he says they're they're rank poison. Remember how Franklin and Hamilton regarded the joys of putting on a Holland shirt. Now they're rank poison to the constitution of this country. And again, the people that have been asking tonight, are we talking about politics and a sense of separatism? It's beginning to appear. This country 
and the absurdity and the danger of importing them at this juncture have been affected with a conjunction of arguments and a cloud of witnesses sufficient to open the eyes of the blind. We live in a land that flows with milk and honey and with suitable culture will present, presently yield us the necessaries and convenience of life and rich abundance. So he's not saying really put down the rank poison. He's really saying let's make some rank poison here and we won't need to kowtow to the British manufacturers, the industrialists there. So he's becoming more and more heavily uh, politicized within this imperial conversation. We have a comment here <clears throat> about the utilization of religious metaphors and language in that last um, passage. Mm -hmm. um, can we go back and take a look at that? Sure, I'd be glad to. Religion always played as a, a motivator. Anybody that's read Thomas Paine's Common Sense realizes how much Old Testament uh, language he used. Where, where, um, well, I guess we live in a land that flows with milk and honey. Biblical yeah. reference there. Sure. Um, let's see, I'm just going through it. Well, I want to I want to go on, but but the, the, witnesses. The, the the person that made that observation is absolutely true. these these men and women that are being asked to step up and to put down some of their consumer pleasures are children of the Great Awakening. They're children of uh, the first great evangelical movement in this country, and they responded not with embarrassment, but with eagerness to um, uh, scriptural injunction. I mean, it's, 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 it's true. Um, but I'd like to have our group tonight really pay attention to this ar arresting claim. Again, we're still in the New London Gazette. I might say, if any of you are from Eastern Connecticut, over where New London is, it was one of the most radical political areas in all of the colonies, and I've never understood why, but that was that was pretty tough to be a loyalist in West Eastern Connecticut. But the, uh, the line that really, I think, um, draws our attention, let us save our money in order to save our country. Let the business of importation already think us with difficulties and dangerous pursuit come to a period, and there is an end. Now, it'd be interesting to see how your students, how, how they would react to a document like that. It's a very, very powerful, let us save our money in order to save our country. Uh, so you see Philo Patria, that's the way they signed these these documents. We have no no way of knowing if it's a man or a woman or an elite person. But we are asking the line three from the bottom to to do away with our unconquerable abit, appetite for filthy lucre uh, would sell their country. Uh, which obtained a tend to involve America in irretrievable, it's spelled oddly, ruin. Well, ladies and gentlemen, that's about as strong as you can put it. It's up, it's, it's coming up to you. You want to save your country, you stay away from the stores and the China bowl and that nice silver spoon and those Holland shirts, those silver buckles, they got to go if you want to save your country. And, uh, I, again, I, I really would be interested to know how the students of the 21st century would respond to a document like that. Well, I got a response <clears throat> uh, on that very point. My students are very familiar and comfortable with the idea that their consumer choices have a voice of their own. So they, they would probably understand that kind of language. We have another very good uh, question here. Mm -hmm. How did colonial merchants view these boycotts. They were losing their livelihood for the greater good. So was the merchant class largely loyalist or were they behind the patriots? The, the merchants by and large uh, were uh, forced uh, to either be quiet or support the um, patriot cause. 
Now, there were some merchants, such as the Hutchison family in Boston, that um, tried to stand up to um, the movement, but um, they could not do so. Um, we're going to come to a document soon, uh, Richard, that gives you a, a, even the sharper tone of enforcement. And, uh, you know, if you, if you were a merchant in Boston and you tried to import these goods, you were visible and you were in a dangerous situation. We have another very good question here. Did these calls for an end to importation spur an increase in local manufacturing of the products previously made in England? So what effect did the boycotts have on American manufacturing? That's a, that's a great question, and there was a lot of encouragement for it. Um, but in point of fact, um, Americans just simply could not make sufficient cloth to close the population. It wasn't until... 25 years later that there were looms or knitting uh, mills that were anywhere equivalent, even vaguely equivalent to Britain. Uh, Americans tried to make glass and it was a failure. Uh, they, uh, we have a one wonderful story of um, in Pennsylvania of uh, people buying uh, ceramics that were made in the mid Midlands of, of England. All right, so listen to what I'm saying. Let's say you have a, a beautiful bowl made in Staffordshire. It has to get on a boat, come across the ocean, be unloaded, carted somewhere into, say, Germantown area of America. And they found that they were able to undercut local potters with better goods. I mean, it's a little bit like the story of the car industry over the last 20 years, uh, 40 years. So um, Americans tried to be self uh, to make their own good, but it just frankly didn't work. The choice then is do without or um, cheat and and buy goods. Now here we have two wonderful letters, and uh, I know we're the time is running, Richard. Um, the first is George Washington to his neighbor, and any of you who have been down to Virginia, you know that there's two wonderful plantations, one Mount Vernon and the other Mason's uh, Gunston Hall. I, if you're near there, I advise you to go and take your students. They're wonderful places. But So Washington is saying, oh, geez, uh, boy, this, uh, the people in the north are adopting this scheme, and it seems uh, really, really uh, good. Um, and maybe we should think about it, but um, then we, we, we find this almost autobiographical comment. The extravagant and expensive man has the same good plea to retentious ex expenses. expenses. He is thereby furnished with the pretext to live within bonds uh, and embrace it. You know, so this is a sacrifice. But he said, but, but this imaginary man, not Washington, of course, but I'm ashamed to do it. And besides, such an alteration in the system of my living will create suspicions of a decay in my fortune, such a thought the world must not harbor. And there was this is exactly the world of Morrison. He's in Morrison saying, well, my God, if I, I am retrenched and I don't have some of this good stuff, people will think less of me. I'll lose honor. I'll lose faith. And he says, this I am satisfied is the way that many who have set out on the wrong track have reasoned, i.e. Washington, till ruin stares them in the face. And in respect to the poor and needy man, he is only left in the same situation he was found. Or I might say, because he judges from comparison, his condition is amended in proportion as it approaches nearer to those above him. Now, if you don't have a question, we go Mason, who was a tough lawyer, brilliant man, and he writes to Washington, and he's saying, you know, as a friend and neighbor, George, get real here. Our all is at stake. And the little conveniences and comforts of life, when set in competition with our liberty, ought to be rejected not with reluctance, but with pleasure. And so he goes on in that quotation there to say, you know, the goods are now means of oppression, and, and uh, 
he says there in the bottom, this would quickly awaken their attention. They would see, they would feel the oppressions we grow under. We're going to make the English manufacturers feel our pain. And so, George, you've got to cooperate. You're a leader. And if, if, if you're worried about your status or the good life or the silver spoon, we're not going to make it. And we'll be taxed by a parliament that will raise revenues in America. So I ask the participants tonight, and one that other historians have, how much of a sacrifice is it to give up the consumer marketplace? Is it just a, a little lark? Like, oh, well, maybe we won't buy South African wine, or, oh, maybe we won't buy California lettuce. Or is it more demanding, more, more difficult? Just, just what are the Americans expected to do in their, their homes in order to overthrow British oppression? That's the question, and it's a, it's a hard one. Yeah. How much would any of us sacrifice for the common good? Uh, and yet we know that at the founding of our own country, people actually stepped up and did what we today find almost impossible to imagine. I notice here that Mason is uh, using the boycott or talking about the boycott as a way to inflict uh, some pain on Britain. Right. Uh, they would, they would, this would quickly awaken their attention. They would see, they would feel the oppressions we groan under and mm -hmm. exert themselves to procure us redress. Um, how, how much, to what extent was that, that, that issue of, you know, um, getting back at them and inflicting some pain on them and uh, making them feel empathetic? Was that a widespread argument for the boycotts? Absolutely. Um, the argument went like this. Look, a lot of Britain, uh, British workers uh, make cloth, make uh, metal goods, make glassware. And if we stop buying them, they're going to be huge unemployment in uh, large parts of England. And they're going to be, uh, then these workers will be um, upset and write to Parliament and say, look, uh, members of Parliament, leave America alone. You're ruining our market. That, that was the Americans' argument. They dreamed of this. Uh, but, you know, frankly, it wasn't until 1774 that these boycotts were so effective that they began to really have an impact on Britain. Uh, and that by that time, uh, we had real battles going on. Uh, what I'm well, saying is, is that the boycotts slowly slowly became more and more effective over time. And when these guys are writing to each other, it was still in process. I see. Okay, so that answers another one of our forum questions. How effective were they? You're saying that they they became very effective uh, over time by the mid by the mid 1770s. That is correct. Absolutely. Um, uh, and uh, so uh, we know that uh, uh, in in 1772, probably more goods were imported from England at any other time in the whole history of colonial America. Uh, but by 1773 and 1774, um, the market is cut. Um, and so by the end of 74, it's, it's almost non-existent. They, they've, 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 they've stopped the consumer marketplace. Okay. But again, you, by that time, you have the Tea Party, and you're going to have uh, Lexington and Concord and uh, Bunker Hill. So there's other things in, in going on. But... We go on here, and this Would is you, before a, we go on. A, Tim, sure. I've got a really good question here. Did Great Britain boycott anything in retaliation, such as tobacco? No, it did. It, there was never any thought uh, at that time of Britain responding in kind. And I'll tell you the reason why is that even though we were colonies of England or empire, uh, England collected a really good whacking tariff customs of the importation of tobacco and uh, it brought so much money into the treasury that they were reluctant to uh, cut that off but after the revolution 
after the revolution, uh, Britain uh, cut American merchants and traders off from all of the market in the Caribbean. They could not trade with Britain any, any longer uh, except under the most onerous conditions. So in a sense, the table, table was turned. Mm -hmm. We have another question here. Given the system of mercantilism, what other markets did the uh, English, English industrialists have? Um, well, whenever, whenever a country, whether it's America or England or China today, uh, uh, experiences a huge burst of consumer manufacturing, the major market is always the country itself. It was English people buying English goods, Chinese people buying Chinese goods, and so on. As far as exportation, exports, England was then developing a pretty robust market in Eastern uh, Europe um, and um, in what is Germany, what is now uh, Poland. And um, while these markets uh, weren't uh, total replacements for America, there was uh, maybe a, I'll use a metaphor here. There was in England a Plan B and a Plan C as far as unloading some of these goods. Okay, well, shall we now, take a look at coercion here? Yeah. Now this is a this is a um, what is called a broadside, and that was it's just simply this was printed as you see it and then pasted on the walls of perhaps on a tavern or around the streets. And we see what now this boycott is taking a, a coercive side. William Jackson, an importer at the Brazen Head north side of the townhouse and opposite the town pump. This is your, your uh, Google uh, map here. It's telling you exactly where this guy Jackson works out. And it's desired that the sons and daughters, now, now note that, this is not being politically correct. What we've seen in these documents from the very beginning of Mrs. Franklin is that women are centrally located. So here we have, you hear, everyone hears about the sons of liberty, but not many textbooks talk about the daughters of liberty. But without them, we're not going to stop Jackson. The sons and daughters of liberty would not buy any one thing of him, for in so doing, they will dis bring disgrace upon themselves, their posterity forever and ever. Amen. A little religion there. So what we're doing is publicly calling out Jackson. We're ruining his business because he has refused um, to go along with the boycott. So. We have, uh, uh, by, by this time, on the eve of independence, a, a powerfully public coercive element in making this consumer marketplace political. This is a good time to bring in a question that we had earlier. Um, did a black market develop in British goods? Um, not too much, um, because there was no there was no other uh, source that was really reliable. Uh, there, I mean, there was some smuggling, but uh, most historians today feel that the history of smuggling and the claims about smugglers are vastly overrated. Mm -hmm. We have another question here too. <clears throat> if the, uh, the boycott inevitably slowed economic activity here in the colonies. I mean, there were, there, if people weren't buying things, there simply wasn't a whole, there was a good deal less money in circulation. So our question, was there any significant negative effect on the local economy as a result? Did this cause a recession? It's, that is a terrific question, Richard. And um, certainly the, the flow of, of goods, the uh, the available of capital for investment and whatnot was uh, depressed, decreased because of the uh, the slowdown basically of of market activity. There's no question whether we would call it a recession, uh, whether we would rate it as that, and or whether there was real suffering on the ground is is very very difficult to uh, demonstrate. As far as foodstuffs. Americans were able to feed themselves very, very well. 
so that uh, this was not a, a consumer move that was bringing starvation or you know epidemic disease because of changes. Um, what was, went lacking uh, at first was uh, clothes, and we know that people began to wear hand-me-downs or uh, keep clothes an extra year. They talked about it the same way some of us might say, well, you know, gas prices are five dollars a gallon. Hey, you know, I think I'll maybe I'll keep that car another year or two before I buy a new one. Um, that that's the kind of decision making process. We have another. We have a participant with another with a sharp eye for uh, religious rhetoric. Uh, the religious rhetoric adds a righteous flair to the statement, justifying the damage the notice will do. It's a good point. Absolutely. Um, and then here's another uh, comment um, about the uh, effectiveness of the boycotts. What is your take on the percent of colonial population mobilized toward patriotism in the 1770s? And the participant would like to you to consider broadly Native Americans, free and saved blacks, pacifists, and so on. So by the 1770s, how many people are you know responding and can be called patriots at that point? Okay, let's take the year, just to answer you uh, fairly, let's take the year um, uh, 1775, in other words, a year before the Declaration of Independence. And I'm going to try to answer quickly, uh, but I, I, th I think it's informed. There's a famous statement that came from John Adams that one-third of the people were patriots, one-third were neutrals, and one-third favored Britain and that has gone down in the textbooks is truth. Now, there was no polling. There was no Gallup poll in those days. And what I have found in my own research and others is that the ability to enforce things like boycott and other uh, political mechanisms through local committees is that the patriots However big their number in percentage of the population, and we're talking about white farm families here, uh, they were able to silence the Tories and bring the neutrals on board. So that by the time of the Declaration of Independence, the overwhelming majority of the American white population, two million, about two million people, um, was uh, supportive of revolutionary protests in one form or another. Uh, but 500,000 people were black and enslaved and weren't part of this political conversation. Most Native Americans, till the bitter end, supported Great Britain against the colonists. And um, most Native American historians today believe the American Revolution it's this, the American Revolution was the greatest defeat and the greatest tragedy in the history of American Native, Native Americans. And that was because when Britain was defeated, uh, it opened the frontier to the most rapacious um, seizure of Indian lands in the history of the West. So the American Revolution was an utter and total disaster for the American Indians. I hope that answers the question. Uh, if it seems imprecise, it's because we don't have the kind of numbers you'd expect today. Mm -hmm. So by 1775, you're saying the overwhelming majority of Americans were in favor of, the overwhelming majority of white Americans, men and women, were in favor of independence. Or were adopted a stance that they, in other words, knew, New, new, neutrality was not, I mean, we don't have a measure of their, the level of their enthusiasm, but you can imagine a Gallup poll and that most people would respond by 1775 and say, yeah, sure, I'll go along with this. Mm -hmm. so one we have, another. Okay, so, and we have, a, we have a question here about um, the uh, eventual growth of American business. And you mentioned that uh, right after the revolution, uh, when the country had gained its independence, it had to go back to buying British goods because we didn't have any manufacturers to speak of in this country. How long did it take us to develop that manufacturing sector and achieve um, some sort of independence in terms of manufactured goods? I've interpreted our question there a little bit, but uh, I think yeah, that is an appropriate way to pose it. Right. Uh, 
In terms of manufactured goods or and what you would call investment capital, capital that might be used, for instance, of building a new canal, it is estimated that our economy remained a colonial economy, we might say today a third world economy, until the 1830s. It wasn't until then that the mills of New England, the canals of the country were able to create a viable and competitive infrastructure where we were independent of the colonial status. Okay, so it was really about the 1830s then that we begin to see the growth of the beginnings of American businesses that would later become lucrative and uh, right. well known. Or okay. you might say it's it's that that's the point in which we we can begin to talk credibly about the development of the industrial revolution. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, before we go on to our last slide and wrap things up, we have a question here: Did any foreign countries benefit from the boycotts? Were there any increases in demand for products from other countries other than Britain? And you mentioned that earlier in connection with France, and your response was that no, that the Americans were so taken with British goods that they really didn't turn to other countries for imports. Is that fair to say? In the colonial period, that's true. Once the war began. And it was, remember, we're talking about a seven or eight year con conflict. Um, the British Navy effectively cut off the possibility of rival nations supplying the Americans for goods. I mean, uh, the tra tra trade was pretty well stopped. Um, so however much the Americans during the war would have liked to get at Dutch and French goods, they just simply, uh, they could not do it because of the military situation. Okay, well, shall we move on then to our final final text? Sure. And this is a, uh, the article, the, the first Continental Congress, the first Congress that became the Congress of the United States of America met on September 5th, 1774 in Philadelphia. It was a gathering of the best and the brightest. It was totally illegal. These men came to Philadelphia to try to figure out ways uh, to um, develop strategies to resist what they regarded as intolerable oppression by parliament. And in the first days of that first Congress, what do they talk about? Do they talk about arming the people? Not so much. They talk about uh, other kinds of uh, insurgency or terrorism? No. They talk about that from and after the first day of December next, we will not import into British America from Great Britain or Ireland, which was a colony, any goods, wares, merchandise. In other words, the, the immediate decision of our most radical and illegal meeting, the first Congress, was to enforce this boycott that had been developing. And it became, at that point, the signature of American protest against colonial oppression. And you see they, they list things and we're going to, uh, um, I, I don't think we have another one, but um, they form committees in every town, every county, every city in America, these, the Congress did, uh, to enforce the boycott. And these local committees were called committees of safety or committees of observation. And they really did a job uh, ferreting out neutrals and ferreting out Tories. Uh, I think American historians are surprised uh, when they tell the story of the coming of the revolution that the first major break by Congress with the empire was a break in the consumer market and an infrastructure that enforced buying habits of ordinary people in ways that um, propelled the revolution to a successful uh, Declaration of Independence. Okay, we have a question. Um, does non-exportation agreement mean that the colonists stopped exporting tobacco products even though the British still wanted them for reasons we discussed earlier? Um, yeah, what do we mean there by the non-exportation agreement? That, now, non-importation, we've been talking about that all night, right. but now non-exportation. What are we right. talking about there? Well, the colonists at this point are so frustrated that they're saying, okay, we're gonna stop 
all this consumer importation, but we're also going to hurt England by denying them. We're going to do it, not England. We're going to deny them access to South Carolina rice and indigo, uh, Virginia, Maryland tobacco. What they're doing is moving here to basically seize up uh, all imperial exchange in the name of independence. Um, it was complicated, um, but uh, at the end of the day, fully and robustly enforced. Uh, you could say that in a sense, the birth of America is a founded on the interruption and the redefinition of the capitalist economy for purposes of colonial liberation. Well, I think one of our participants has, has summed it up beautifully. She writes, thesis, the boycott was at the heart of the revolution. And you're saying it was also the foundation of the nation. Fair to say? Fair to say. And as I, I hope we've, we've had the questions. I can't tell you how much, ladies and gentlemen, you're anonymous to me. But your questions have been right on target, and I thank you very much. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we have come to the end of our seminar, so let me uh, pose, uh, uh, tell you as our last shot, have any closing questions or comments before we wrap things up this evening? Anything else to throw in over the transom? Okay, I don't see anything else coming in, so let me tell you, please continue to use the forum, uh, continue the discussion there, uh, share fresh approaches. If, if you have any questions that uh, come up after the seminar, put them in the forum and we will pass them along to Tim. We'll monitor the forum until November 2nd, and uh, after that time, <clears throat> we'll... Uh, I'll have to discontinue it. But, ladies and gentlemen, I want to thank you for your uh, participation this evening. It was very insightful and intelligent, and as Tim said, you really posed some wonderful questions. Please remember to submit your evaluations. Those are very important to us. And, Tim, I want to thank you for giving us another wonderful seminar. It, it was really delightful. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Okay, folks, I hope you'll join us again for our other seminars. Um, please go back to our website, see what we have in the fall. We'll be soon posting our spring schedule. I think you'll find some interesting topics there. So, ladies and gentlemen, again, thank you very much, and good evening.